Um, what would an ANU state of the Pacific be without some analysis of where gender equality is in the Pacific? It would not be a state of the Pacific. So I'm very glad that you're all here with me. Um, I'm so excited by the panel that have joined me in these discussions. Um, I'm not going to read everyone's bios because they are in the program and I encourage you to read those illustrious biographies. I just want to make the point that we have with us the foremost, I think, Pacific theorists on masculinity with us here today <laughs> and the foremost theorists on Pacific feminism. <laughs> no, that, that's not true. Uh, just on masculinity. Um, so I'm going to start by inviting uh, Mercy Massa, Dr. Mercy Massa, to join us and to talk about masculinities in the Pacific. Thanks, Mercy. Thank you, Tru um, Thank you so much for having the hype and the energy um, to be here this afternoon. Um, so for the few moments that I have, it, you can hear me from the back, yeah? Okay, great. Um, from a few moments um, or minutes that I have with you, I'll be talking about my research, which is on Pacific Island masculinity um, and which centers on the voices of men in Fiji and in Papua New Guinea on factors that influence um, com contemporary masculinities and, and perspectives, as well as experiences of men in gender and development. So the gender and development spaces in which we work or study um, can be highly contested and politicized. Within these spaces, there are common grounds in which practitioners, activists, and academics from time to time may find themselves in and supporting or rejecting one or the other requires a critical lens. It is undeniable that tensions exist within the gender and development space. One particular contest contestation is in regards to the involvement of men in gender equality and violence against women programs in the Pacific. <coughs> the recognition of men's um, responsibilities, roles, and their potential contributions to achieving Gender equality was first recognized almost over 20 years ago, and the role of men in gender and development since then has become increasingly defined and capitalized on in programs as well as in policies, um, dis policy discourses. These efforts range from community-based uh, mobilization to government-initiated programs being led by pro-feminists as well as anti-feminists. It is important to recognize that the practice and politics of involving men in anti-violence um, work is fraught with complexities, as working with men as allies can create tension it, as it involves engaging a socially privileged group um, to work on dismantling the very thing that gave them that privilege. Despite the rising global trend in engaging men and boys, there is still limited engagement of men and boys in the Pacific, and the limited programs targeting efforts to transform violent masculine behaviors in the region. The need to work with men and boys in prevention of violence against women and in pro promoting gender equality um, is well accepted and distilled as one of the best practice principles among policymakers, educators, and advocates. So I will now talk about um, some of the specific concerns that were raised by men um, during my study in relation to efforts that aim to reduce violence against women or promote gender equality. So firstly, um, there is an overwhelming view by men that there is not enough support given to help men transform from toxic or negative masculinity to more positive forms of masculinity. <coughs> Men in the study felt um, that they are left out and they blame this on feminism and uh, a women-centered sort of approach towards um, development. So from a feminist uh, perspective, the view that men are left behind can be troubling as it assumes a, a level playing field um, at the start, which is mis a misleading assumption as women um, are merely closing the gap on sharing power and not as asserting power over, over men. R Richard Eves and others in 2018 noted that the perception that men have 
that they are missing out is a common backlash by men who feel that they have been excluded from benefits accrued to women as a result of um, development programming. This backlash from men also suggests that power is seen by men in, in terms of a zero-sum uh, zero game, where increases of power for women um, add up to the loss of power for men. Excluding men from violence and gender interventions can provoke male retaliation and hostility, which then deepens gender equalities, leaving women with more work to do. The, the second concern that may, men in my study um, raised was that the outlook of gender equality and violence against women programs should be one that advocates or demonstrates partnership or cooperation between men and women. Um, participants express the view that gender equality or anti-violence uh, programs delivered by women or women's organizations without men as partners or allies um, is damaging to the relational and hierarchical structures that exist in our Pacific societies. Participants suggested that men should be seen by the community as uh, partners working alongside women to deliver these programs. In societies where community or institutional members maintain um, conservative views, gender equality or anti-violence um, programs that do not embrace social, um, local or social, as well as cultural understandings of gender, family, or even justice may be seen as a threat. Um, the value of carefully navigating relationships is real, realized when men and women work in harmony and when community members accept or engage in gender programs. When individuals or organizations overlook existing relationship structures and hierarchies and operate on a different system, they face the risk of losing support um, or interest from individuals or groups in the community. Another concern described by some participants is the need for safe spaces or, or safe places for men, as well as support groups. Um, and these support groups help men to reflect and self-transform before they become allies or supporters of women. Um, participants stress that there is a real emotional healing that needs to be done first before men can be um, fully engage and want to support women. And this comes from this sort of support groups which help men to um, think deeply or critically and reflect with other men. However, participants discussed um, that this kind of support or spaces do not exist for men within our gender programs in the region. So creating these environments where men can gather their thoughts, emotions, reflect deeply, discuss openly and honestly with other men, um, explore values and co consider other outlooks crucially depends on guaranteeing that men feel safe and that they are appreciated from judgment and they, sorry, and that they are safe from judgment and, and threat. Melanesian men are taught early in life not to be soft or weak. Making light of hard situations through sharing jokes makes it easier for men to speak about their issues. And while these groups and safe spaces provide a place for healing and transformation um, for men, feminist scholars also caution that they should be spaces that are shared with women's groups um, or with other women so that um, so to avoid men reinforcing negative um, attitudes through conversation. Feminists and pro-feminists also argue that <coughs> involving men in work for preventing violence against women may lead to the reduction of feminist content and orientation services. Um, it can threaten funding and resources for programs and um, services directed at women and marginalize um, women's voices and leadership within the space. Therefore, to minimize this risk, it's, in, it's important for us to um, discuss or understand some of the key principles for engaging um, men in preventing gender-based violence. First, um, men involved in this space must be guided by feminist content and framed with a feminist political agenda. To be a feminist or a pro-feminist or supporter of women's rights is to be guided by principles of gender equality and social justice. Any um, engagement of men in gender-related work should further these goals and at the same time 
it should be sensitive to the cultural and relational structures that exist within various contexts. Secondly, interventions must be committed to enhancing boys' and men's lives. For instance, strengthening an individual's knowledge and skills enhances their capacity of preventing violence and promoting um, safety for women and for themselves. Thirdly, um, they must address diversities among men. Given the diverse uh, masculine identities um, and values in every society, there is a need to understand how programs translate into practice and to explore men's various um, identities and responsibilities. Finally, um, men's anti-violence uh, work must be done in partnership with women and women's groups. There is a, uh, a widespread agreement that um, this work must be done in partnership with um, women and even they have to be accountable to women um, or women's or feminist groups. The ideal or principle of accountability should be widespread in any gender-focused work with men. The notion of accountability comes out of the politics of oppression and the politics of knowledge. It is based on two overlapping foundational ideals. First, struggles against oppression should be led by those who are oppressed. Um, second, when it comes to systems of oppression or inequality, those who are oppressed or disadvantaged have a much better understanding of systems than those who are privileged or advantaged. Um, as privilege and injustice often are invisible to members of the dominant group. So that leads me to the end of my um, presentation. Thank you very much. and he is also going to lead us through a journey of Pacific Aegean masculinities. Thank you. Bula, everyone. Um, Bula. <laughs> uh, so unlike Dr. Messi's, uh, my presentation is based on my thesis, which I have sort of started, but I haven't been in the field. So it's just a, um, an introduction uh, of what I'm thinking of doing uh, going forward. Um, so my thesis looks at, uh, examines masculinities in Fijian politics, how it operates, how it's produced and reproduced uh, through political events. Um, and uh, just to start, um, men have not generally been seen as gendered subjects uh, throughout history. History has been written about men um, playing influential role in creating history, making history, but they haven't been seen as gendered subjects. Uh, whereas women, uh, women's liter literature, feminist literature has uh, sort of made women uh, and their marginalization from the broader political processes as gendered. Uh, so the idea is to flip the narrative um, of, instead of investigating why women are underrepresented, why women are marginalized, uh, it's to look at how male power and privilege function uh, and how politics continuously tends to uh, put men at an advantage. Uh, and Fiji generally is a very interesting place uh, to study masculinities because of our, his of our history of uh, coups, political instabilities, have sort of promoted and projected an idea of what type of men are generally privileged. So within the group of men, there are special hierarchies as well. Uh, so it makes us go back, well, made me go back into Fiji history and reread Fiji history from a gendered lens, uh, especially from a masculine lens as well, in trying to see, uh, in trying to investigate how male power and privilege do function uh, in Fiji politics. So it's just a brief history of Fiji. Um, one of the reasons why Fiji's history as well, uh, Im Im important and interesting as well is we're a plural, plural, plural society, yet very divided along ethnic lines. So a lot of prognosis and interventions around what can be done about Fiji is seen from an ethnic or racial lens. Um, ethnic cleavages are the most important sort of cleavages that exist. So they subsume gendered cleavages, uh, um, class cleavages as well. And it predominates sort of political discourse in Fiji, that ethnicity is the main problem. And it's sort of, um, Fiji has been described 
as a society is highly divided, it's highly centralized and governmentalized, it's deeply patriarchal, it's a militaristic nation as well. Uh, the military plays a very crucial role in Fijian politics and has for the past 30 years uh, put itself as one of the most important institutions. But it's a highly ethnic institution as well. 99% of the military is indigenous Fijian and it has very close ties or sort of mimics indigenous Fijian societal structures within the military as well in terms of uh, religion, in terms of status. Um, there's a lot of literature around indigenous Fijian masculinities and it's sort of coming out even more. So there are a lot of gender scholars, masculinity scholars who have studied indigenous Fijian masculinities in rugby, in, Christian, uh, in Christianity, uh, in military. However, Indo-Fijian masculinities have not been studied or uh, masculinities in other ethnic groups, minority ethnic groups, have not been studied as at all. So Indo-Fijian masculinities has only been covered by Dr. Gia in his 2019 book and it appears as one chapter. And Indo-Fijian masculinities, oh, indigenous Fijian masculinities are performed, are shaped by tradition and custom, custom. Uh, and the performance of it can be traced to, you know, how Christian devotion takes place uh, in rugby and in the military. Um, what Dr. Gia says is that indo fijian masculinities are shaped by their Indian ancestry, their experiences of uh, being indentured laborers in Fiji, and the political history of Fiji, of their sort of uh, perceived marginalization uh, in Fiji. Printed out these notes, but I keep forgetting uh, to read it. Uh, um, another important point to note as well is that the study of uh, masculinities uh, originated from the West, so it's very Western centric. How do you import these concepts to a post colonial society like Fiji? Uh, and it's the, the nuances, the, the structures, uh, the processes are very different. And what I call, um, when I was doing the introductory Fiji chapter, it's sort of a, sketch, a patchwork of patriarchies that have existed through colonization and post-colonization as well because of the divide and rule policies of uh, the colonial administration, the indirect rule policies. So the indirect rule policies uh, allowed for chief, uh, the colonial government to uh, rule over indigenous Fijians indirectly through the chiefly system, uh, their traditional systems. Indo-Fijians were ruled through the colonial sugar refinery company and by extension the colonial state and then you know the white settler community was governed directly by the state. So it was a patchwork of patriarchies that have created sort of a sense of masculinities that differ. But since post colon uh, since independence uh, these sort of have uh, as communities have intermingled it's created a mishmash of patriarchal masculine norms um, so just a brief sketch of how I conceptualize masculinities in Fijian politics so from independence in 1970 to 1987 there was this whole idea that uh, the chiefly establishment would rule Fiji so there was an inherent sort of dominant ideal that uh, political authority would be chiefly um, and Fiji uh, in Fiji when we talk about uh, founding fathers there are four main founding fathers and these are all high chiefly uh, men from high chiefly eastern establishment uh, however the 1987 coup while promoted on an ideal or idea of restoring chiefly authority is seen as a turning point of the demise of chiefly, chiefly authority in Fijian politics which culminates into 2006 coup, which basically appended sort of chiefly authority altogether by uh, de-establishing the Great Council of Chiefs, uh, by distancing the state from the Methodist Church uh, completely. Um, the two uh, so the coup can also be seen, the 87 military coup can also be seen as a reimposition of the Bati ideology in Fiji, where the military as I mentioned earlier, for indigenous Fijians, the military serves as, a, mm -hmm. in, as an institution that uh, masculinities get formed. So it was that warrior masculinity linked with ethno-nationalism, which has direct links to masculinity. And the 2000 coup, the first coup, uh, civilian coup, was again propagated on the idea of restoration of 
uh, indigenous nationalism, indigenous Fijian ideals. However, it can be also seen in the context of a reimposition of the Bati ideology because the military stepped in and took over the civilian coup and tried to legitimize some of the goals of the coup, uh, the civilian coup. Uh, it can also be seen as an indigenous Fijian versus Indo-Fijian, in, and a lot of authors, a lot of scholars have uh, classified it as that, such, that it's a indo fijian because there was an Indo-Fijian prime minister that was deposed, so it was seen basically through a race ethnic lens. It's a man versus woman uh, concept as well. A lot of feminist scholars have looked at the gendered impacts on women of the coup, uh, masculinity and femininity, uh, it's armed versus unarmed, young versus old ideals, uh, commoner versus chiefs. So Professor John Frankel, uh, Professor Bridge Lal have talked about how the coups in itself, the 87 and 2000 coups, were seen as a commoner versus uh, chiefly authority and there was a push towards uh, putting old traditional sort of colonial chiefly rule back but in particular forms. And then there was also Hindu versus Muslim and different Christian sects in the 2000 coup and the 2006 coup have also come about. These are the evangelical groups that have formed the Methodist Church as the old institution. In the 2006 coup, the Catholic Church was supportive whilst other church groups were not supportive of the coup as well. Um, and Professor Stephanie Lawson talks about this, uh, that civilian Fijian leaders are regarded as legitimate only in so far as uh, they're part of the same social network of aristocratic families that provides military leadership. So there was a sort of, uh, within indigenous Fijian social hierarchy, there is, has been through history in the military that through military performance, chiefs also did get certain political uh, mileage. Uh, the 2006 coup was a masculinist, uh, masculinist standoff between the commander of the military who was an indigenous Fijian man and the leader of the government who represented 85% of indigenous Fijian vote whose party represented. So it was a standoff between a commoner indigenous Fijian political leader and a military indigenous Fijian man. And it's seen as a cleanup coup, as a good governance coup. Well, it was proclaimed as such, as anti-racist coup. However, in the context of masculinities, uh, it actually appended, as I mentioned, the whole idea of chiefs and the chiefly establishment and the role they play in politics because they <coughs> Beni Marama went against the chiefly establishment to the point of de-establishing the Great Council of Chiefs, which has been there, which was constitutionalized in the 1990 and 1997 constitutions. <coughs> Sorry. And it created a sort of a new form of political masculinity where the military became, and this is what uh, Chone Balain Roka Roka says, a super confederacy. It created a patron-client relationship between political elites and the military and a symbiotic sort of relationship between them. Um, so politics does play a very crucial role on, in the creation and construction of masculinities. Um, in 2014, uh, there were seven political parties con contesting the elections. And all of the political parties had female party presidents or party leaders. By 2018, we had only one political party with a female leader. Uh, the transition that is happening in politics is that there is a militarization of politics. So in 2018, by 2018, political parties started recognizing that to ch effectively challenge Beni Marama, you need to have a military leader in your midst to get the military on your side because the military in the constitution is given a very guardi a broad guardianship role. So apart from external security, they are also given the role of securing the well-being and the security of Fijians in Fiji. So the threat of a military coup always lingers on in Fiji and it's not settled that it might happen again. So political parties are slowly realizing that you know in order to challenge Beni Marama, they need to somehow if they win power they need to tame the military and only military personnel in their midst can be able to do that so the military over the past 30 years has has emerged as a major political player in fiji um and as i mentioned earlier you know it's seen as a super confederacy now i'm just about to finish 
Uh, the coups have replaced uh, the chiefly class and political elites with new military elites in Fiji. And it sort of en has en engendered a sense of entitlement within the military as well, that we, if things don't go our way, we can step in and correct this cause. Um, just in the lead up to 2022 20, elections, the main political contest is between uh, the first coup leader and the most recent coup leader. And the media is actually, basically both of them are saying that my coup was better than yours. <laughs> um, Beni Marama is saying that Rambuka's coup was racist. And both of them actually focus on hard security ideas. Which leader can give security to the people that, you know, vote for them. So for Indo-Fijians, the Beni Marama is trying to hype up the fear of 87 and 2000, that if Rambuka comes in, this is what's going to happen. Rambuka is also trying to appeal to the indigenous Fijians, who feel that uh, since the de-establishment of the Great Council of Chiefs, uh, this new ideal of you know, ethnically blind society that Beni Marama is trying to create, uh, has taken away the power and the privilege that they used to enjoy in Fiji politics. So it's an interesting sort of political dynamics. I have not covered Indo-Fijian political masculinities here because not much has been written, so I hope that by going in the field, I'd be able to unpack or uncover how Indo-Fijian masculinities... I have some ideas about it, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, I'll just say this. Uh, the 87 coup, the Prime Minister was Timothy Bawandra, who was a commoner indigenous Fijian man, who was a trained doctor. Uh, Jairam Reddy, who was opposition leader uh, for a very long time, was his attorney general. And Jairam Reddy was seen to be the puppet master of Bavan. The same narrative is being used currently in the current political debate that Ayase at Kiyum, who's a lawyer, is the puppet master of Beni Marama. So there is sort of a delegitimization de of indo indigenous Fijian masculinities by saying that you are not fit for political office because you do not subscribe to certain hegemonic ideals. Therefore, you must be, you know, puppeteered from someone who has to be an Indo-Fijian. It's my hypothesis, and this is how I see it. Um, just in conclusion, I think uh, sort of inverting the whole idea around looking at male power and privilege and male advantage in political space, uh, critical studies of um, men and masculinities, can develop uh, insights more, uh, by more clearly mapping the construction of how masculinities and power shape politics. Uh, uh, and it has potentials to offer new insights into taking into account masculinities uh, and exploring how women's disadvantage in politics might be addressed. Um, and just the emphasis of uh, the impact of politics over how politics in Fiji shapes our social life, our cultural life, and our male subjectivities in Fiji uh, has been bolstered by the current sort of 2006 to the current political sort of Beni Marama era uh, by his deeply authoritarian, interventionist, and very populist uh, tendencies of Beni Marama. So it's sort of shaping also uh, how men construct their masculinities in the everyday practices as well. And I think uh, there are Fiji Women's Rights Movement, uh, Professor Dr. Winston Halapua in his uh, PhD has also looked at how coups have been harmful in a way that violence, everyday violence gets perpetuated and it gets perpetuated at greater levels uh, than normal situations as well. So it has intense repercussions for how hegemonic masculinity is related with uh, the ideas of legitimation, consent, and the hierarchy that it creates within gendered relations, not just between men and women, but gendered relations amongst this whole category of men. Thank you very much. If it wasn't apparent, <coughs> I'd just like to point out that Ramakesh has only been a PhD student for less than 10 months. Um, and I, just, I mean, that is just spectacular. <coughs> it's extremely wonderful to be introducing Jess Collin, Dr. Jess Collin from the Lowy Institute. If you have not read her blogs, what's wrong with you? <laughs> They're wonderful. Thank you, oh, Jess. Thank you. <laughs> okay. 
Well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, I just want to make a point of reflection before I move into my uh, paper today, uh, that I've noticed that pretty much in all the panels today, some sort of a gender aspect has come up, whether it's been men or women, and we just need you know, to point out how important it is to all factors of Pacific life. Now, I'm going to turn now to, to, to talk about women and women's economic empowerment, and I'm going to attempt to answer the question of what economic empowerment means in the Pacific. And my paper today is based on some conversations that I've had uh, with some women in Papua New Guinea uh, about political representation. Uh, is Teresa Mackey still here? I'll give you a shout out because you were my first participant in the podcast. Um, and I'm gonna, I am going to play a bit of audio today, but I, have, uh, I, I won't be playing Teresa today, but I will be giving you a shout out. There are so many quality women in this country and we are missing out on that because of a block, like just a mindset block, I, I think. And courage is part of it. Okay, so we've heard about the mindset uh, thing today, haven't we? And, and Tanya was reflecting, she was a participant in my uh, politics uh, podcast, but she was, and she was reflecting on why it is so hard for women to become political leaders in her country. But the problem that Tanya raises are not just limited to politics and nor are they just limit limited to Papua New Guinea. There are talented women right across the Pacific, needing courage but also so much more, including resources and access to financial and digital infrastructure, as well as economic opportunities. And while I acknowledge the different contexts and diverse environments across all Pacific countries, there is one thing that remains common, that female business leadership and economic empowerment takes courage and the right mindset from not just ambitious women, but from men as well. So everybody needs to get on board. And of course, we heard from Betty today about changing mindsets and how that is so important to progress. And that mindset includes having a deeper understanding of how economic empowerment relates to gender equality right across the Pacific, including what is working and what is not working. And so gender equality is critical to productive eco economies across the Pacific, which have been devastated by COVID-19. Now, Lowy Institute research shows that the Pacific economies, economies will stand to lose a decade of development because of the pandemic. And we also know that Pacific economies are naturally limited by their geographies and are becoming increasingly impacted by extreme weather events. And so, you know, gender equality and how it relates to economic empowerment is absolutely critical. Uh, but it still does remain a distant goal and women are marginalised in informal sectors uh, and pay inequities do persist. But when thinking about gender equality in the Pacific, we need to be cognizant that there are cultural and social norms that do value the role of women. We've heard about that today, that women are valued, but they're just operating in different traditional social structures. And these are in ways that aren't necessarily reflected in donor lenses so, of gender equality. So we need to be careful about the way that we talk about gender equality and the way we apply it to the Pacific. I mean, there are some norms that do create hurdles for economic advancement and participation, and there is work to do, but we do need to frame gender issues in ways that better reflect Pacific worldviews. Again, we heard about uh, the, the being born into responsibility and, and collectivity in Samoa, and that women and youth are an essential pillar to that. We also heard about a productivity of women at different levels and that family is the central unit. So we need to maintain these ideas and, and when we're talking about gender equality and economic empowerment. So change must be led by Pacific women and it must suit their context and priorities. And in many cases, just simply putting food on the table is a priority. Whereas uh, having the capacity for more choices might be a goal. So there should be a distinct understanding between priorities and goals in terms of economic empowerment in the Pacific. But from a government perspective, we know that economic empowerment leads to better development outcomes, which is why governments like Australia are fully behind it. It goes from having you know, more women and children staying longer in school uh, to having uh, better, better social protections and rights for women and girls. 
We've had decades of intervention from the Australian government, uh, so they definitely think it's a priority. Uh, but now they're giving more decision-making capacity to women in the Pacific. Uh, they're, they're taking the Pacific Women Shaping Pacific De Development Program, which has been running for 10 years, and now turning that into Pacific Women Lead, which is really critical uh, to having more effectiveness in these programs and so that women can become the shapers of their own destinies. So this is a it's video... It's impossible to directly compare political and business leadership due to the different contexts, drivers and constraints. Nonetheless, the study finds that women are taking on more leadership roles at higher rates, which tells a promising story. And that story hopefully provides insights for other types of leadership that we see. I am very interested in the question of why women are flourishing in the private sector. And if you go back to look at patriarchy, women flourish and do all the work in the, in the traditional context, but also these private sector can be safe places for women to really flourish because of the talents that they've got that can be, well, that will be acknowledged. So that was a video from the Asian Development Bank's uh, Pacific Private Sector Development Initiative and they were presenting on the Leadership Matters Report. Now there's a whole lot of statistics and data in there that is really important. Uh, just for the sake of time today I won't be going through that, uh, but you can read the report on that and get the important statistics. Um, but the, the message is that uh, women are really flourishing in business and in the business sector and in management positions which is a really great news story. And so what's working? Well, we're seeing that there are gender targets in Pacific businesses and the reporting on, um, on the progress of gender initiatives in Pacific economies, and this is really having impact. Uh, the South Pacific Exchange has, new, has updated its company rules so that when you list on the SPX, uh, companies must report on gender diversity initiatives, and that's also having impact. We're also seeing on-site childcare centres that are slowly emerging in Fiji and in, in, um, in the urban centres, and that's helping uh, to address the problem of uh, families moving away from those traditional childcare options that they have in the rural uh, villages. We're also seeing training and mentoring of women to become leaders and regional be benchmarking as well in the reporting. But much like elsewhere in the world, including in Australia, uh, women continue to be constrained when attempting to reach the highest levels of leadership. For us as individuals, really it's the conversations that we have uh, within the organisations that we work in and with the friends that we have, <coughs> females and men, but particularly uh, trying to look at what talent you have in your organisations. Um, as I said, sometimes it's the treasures inside that we don't, we're looking outside all the time, but we're not looking within. Okay, so we heard, you know, when we were listening to the uh, panel on uh, the elections in Papua New Guinea, that we need to start having those conversations in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the same thing uh, is being shared about uh, women in, uh, in business as well, uh, that we need to start having those conversations in the workplace. Uh, we heard from Samoan PM uh, uh, Fiamme Mata Arthur earlier this year uh, that we need also less talk and more action. And so what are we doing and what can we focus on that is going to help with women's economic empowerment? Leadership is one thing, um, but the message that I would like to share is that we leave nobody behind. So we go beyond those circles where opportunities for leadership already exist. And we heard from Dr. Judy Swan before talking about the emerging leaders uh, that uh, tend to get the same opportunities year after year, and we need to make sure that we go beyond that. And so we must reach into disconnect of communities and leave nobody behind. Um, financial and digital infrastructure is going to be key for the economic advancement of women in uh, Pacific communities. So digital tech platforms will be able to help women to manage uh, the family and pursue economic opportunities um, if they still have to operate from within the home. Uh, access to credit, microfinance, lending and access to bank accounts and that formal structure will help women, uh, particularly if they want to start small businesses. Mobile wallets, I think, will be uh, really key. Will be key to un unlocking potential uh, for women in the Pacific as well. Uh, if we can get uh, more liquidity to small local operators, and that will help rural rural women leverage more informal forms of technology. We've also heard about migration today and the benefits for our families, but I think the real benefit for that is for women and being able to have that choice uh, to participate in PALM schemes and bring their family with them or go with their families as well. So it's about giving women 
uh, choices. Uh, and as we heard from Aka, uh, making informal mature choices and having those options, I think that's really important. Um, remittances, uh, remittances are gendered, so typically more women uh, rely on remittances than men, but as uh, women's um, economic empowerment advances and we have more women on the Palm Scheme, uh, we can see that they have greater control over their finances because they are the ones that are actually uh, sending the remittances. And upskilling will also be essential to unlocking potential and we can get that through uh, the Migration Scheme as well. So to bring it back to my overarching question, what does economic empowerment mean in the Pacific? I think it means two things. Um, choices is one. And um, I think we need to think about uh, you know, the, the differences of informal and formal work. Um, I think we need to think about it or frame it differently um, because informal work can bring flexibility to the women that are uh, trying to um, advance their economic opportunities uh, and allow them to work from home as they uh, start from there. I think we need to think about using childcare differently as well and being digitally uh, uh, connected digitally. And I think they, uh, these things offer um, choices for women. I just wanted to offer an alternative perspective as well uh, to um, Matt um, with the, the, um, the issue of uh, family separation and what that can do for marriage breakdowns because I have heard anecdotes of uh, women that have participated in the Palm Scheme they have uh, since gone back uh, and divorced uh, from their husband, but they came to Australia and they saw that actually it's not okay uh, to have violence in my home. And you know they, they were able to go back and make those choices and, and the Palm Scheme of Migration was actually able to give them so, those choices. So it's not always a bad news story. Um, the point of collaboration, we've heard it a lot today. Um, men and women must be along for the journey. Uh, and empowering women safely so that uh, women's economic successes don't inflame existing financial stresses in the household or create more opportunities for more public crimes against women. And also on the point of donor collaboration, uh, coordination, donors must work effectively alongside Pacific women who are leading in this space. Thank you. We've got one to go. If you have any questions, you can catch me on this email address as well. Thank you so much, Jess. Um, agency and collaboration, um, really important. And I think what has really tied the, the panel together uh, so far is the question of thinking about gender equality in very different ways and how we continue to do that. Um, Domenica and I are going to change tack a little bit now. And um, I need one on the desk to make sure that we stick to about 10 minutes about. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, yes, I, I think I promised the last one. Uh, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you're all mic'd up? Yeah. Um, Domenica and I um, are in the process of writing a paper about teaching um, feminisms with Pacific Islanders. Um, and in the process of writing this paper, we've been having a lot of conversations, and so we thought we would replicate the conversations that we've been having here in 10 minutes. Um, so uh, we have some questions to help guide us. And I guess the first question is around what is your actual course and how do you teach it and who do you teach it with? Oh, okay. Well, hello, I'm Dr. Domenica. <laughs> um, since 2018, I've been coordinating the Gender Studies program at USP. This is a postgraduate program and it comprises a postgraduate certificate, offers postgraduate certificates and diplomas, and it includes four courses. Uh, one is about contemporary feminism, which is, I guess, the most nightmarish for students, <laughs> and uh, then gender development, gender environment, and research methodologies in, uh, yeah, in gender studies. And most of the students are uh, professionals. And I guess I should say something about me. Um, I have uh, conducted extensive uh, ethnographic research in Maori context, uh, focusing particularly on uh, the construction of masculinities in the rugby field, well, within rugby. 
So I, I have only recently started teaching feminisms um, and I do it in the context of a research, an intensive research program called the Pacific Research Colloquium that we run um, through DPA. And so um, it's with a select group of <laughs> students um, select in the sense that we select them to come um, and also then they self-select and so there are very few students who choose to do specific feminisms. I'm not taking that personally. Um, but uh, I, teach, I teach specific feminisms as a, a piece of research and so it's a very open course. It doesn't come with too much content, um, predetermined content. A lot of the content is kind of delivered through guests, lectures and conversations in the class. Um, and I guess the next kind of question that we asked ourselves um, was why, why were we motivated, I guess, to think about the way in which we teach these courses? What, why? Why are we having, why are we making all these people listen to us? <laughs> Just mention that teaching feminism is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, no, that's not a good answer. Um, well, um, I should say that this program, I guess to start with, uh, USP has been growing exponentially in terms of interest, which speaks to the fact that the, gender, the term gender is more and more out there, um, as a, you know, gender awareness is a job requirement also. Um, USP is placing emphasis on uh, promoting gender equality through research. Um, and then, so there's a lot of interest and then students come in, but they actually have to uh, engage with families. And there are a lot of emotions that manifest when it comes to families. As uh, Marcy was mentioning, um, there's, there are different forms of hostility because it's, uh, it may be perceived as anti-men, uh, as giving up much space to diversity, as a threat uh, to cultural values, religious values, and as a Western, um, a Western concept. So it was interesting for me, you know, how do you actually um, get students to own the theory? Um, also, how do get students' knowledge to be part of the whole of the learning material and how do students get to make the sense, the gender lens, um, their own in a context that expects them to be, uh, uh, to have this kind of awareness. Um, for me, from my perspective, that was, uh, that was quite challenging. And also this awareness that I bring my own story as a person you know, engaging with ideas of gender equality and I've done my research uh, you know, in, uh, on gender and the students bring their own stories, their own emotions, their own motivations. I was just wondering how can we you know, work together, journey together, um, uh, yeah, trying to um, bypass hostility and also deal with a lot of sensitive issues that come up when we explore feminist theory. In, in the conversations that we've had, and, and you know, there is a, l a little bit of irony here, but um, irony in the sense that both Dominic and I have Italian backgrounds. We find ourselves, we, we've never met before we started having these conversations, um, but we find that having an Italian background has meant perhaps that we approach this teaching practice with an awful lot of emotion. Emotion, I, there are no stereotypes here, um, but, maybe just a few, um, but, but certainly we became very clear in our conversations that um, there are key emotions uh, that, that kind of drive our approach to the teaching of feminism um, and the most overarching is one of humility um, and, and I guess a sense of empathy and trying to create a space in which there can be empathy when we have these discussions. Um, and I think it was really interesting that um, we did have to think about our own positionality and certainly positionality is one of the tools that 
we use in the course of the teaching um, and of course that means that we also have to reflect on where we've come from and I, and perhaps again not um, not surprisingly we both had quite I wouldn't say traumatic but um, defining histories with the term feminism in our own pasts um, perhaps I became more of the um, yes I, I don't think anyone would find it surprising to know that I define myself as a feminist um, whereas Domenica is, is still in the journey on that one day she become <laughs> I mean all the students as I said ask you by default that I'm feminist and I guess why Anyway. Yes, and then we've also had lots of discussions about how white we are. Um, but also, um, and, and, and Domenica is from southern Italy, um, and um, I have a, a parent who's from Africa. So again, there's, there's a lot of question mark around all of that. Um, but also, I guess we were also motivated by the hostility as another emotion towards um, <laughs> we have just started. <laughs> we are Italian. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> you do, do you want to say one actually when you go see one way? Um, but anyway, um, so I guess these are three defining emotions um, humility, empathy, and hostility. And how do we approach this question, these questions and these emotions in our teaching? And well, I was, I've been thinking, first of all, thank you, because she got me out of my head. I've been thinking about these things for the last uh, two years and a half. Um, after I started you know, kind of navigating this space, I was thinking that for me, uh, the goal, I guess, has been to transcend feminism itself as a term and its Western frame. So with the students, I have worked a lot on the notion of Pacific women which is this label that come, you know, is used in development, is used in feminism. So for example, what does this term obliterate? What does it include? Um, um, who has, the, in a sense, the power of representation within you know, the region? So it has shifted the conversation. It has brought, you know, students start to look within. So, for example, if you talk about Pacific women and gender is relational, so where can we talk about Pacific men? What are Pacific masculinities made of? How do we work? Um, how do we uh, approach coloniality in the context of masculinities in the region? And what about Pacific gender and sexual diversity? That is it all the place, in what terms? And you know, in, then students start exploring more and more. For example, if you look at notions like Micronesia, Melanesia, Polynesia, how do they um, impact you know, representation and inclusion? So students start dealing with issues of racism. They start dealing with bread. They start dealing, um, you know, where is the place for non-indigenous uh, uh, women or indigenous men? Uh, this, you know, in the context where everybody sees themselves as Pacific men, Pacific women, and so on and so forth. So, trying to work on everybody's stories and using creative tools has allowed to actually move into another range of emotions that are not the emotions that, you know, towards feminists per se, but actually the emotions that start from, you know, looking at relations that students have in their daily lives and how colonial history impacts them and um, their aspirations in terms of you know, gendered experience and narratives that we want to be in this Pacific, uh, feminine specific women slash men slash queer and so on and so forth. Um, some of, because I, well, a big number of students are my class is Fijian, you could say that, but anyway, there's a good chunk of students of Indo-Fijian descent, so the, um, sorry, Indo-Fijian students, and so the question has been, you know, 
where are the gender narratives, how can they fit in the discussion, conversation. But to get the kind of discussion, you know, conversation we have to work a lot around these stories and how these stories, everybody's stories, so mine as well, are embedded in specific histories, in specific cultural settings and religious settings, politics. Um, so I guess I have worked a lot. Uh, I think I've, st I've used a lot of storytelling and um, just making space for emotions <coughs> and kind of move beyond feminism itself, even though we're always using feminist theory in debates. And I think that there's been such a lot of power in the emotions that are raised in that journey. Um, and, and I mean, I'm quite happy to share that at the end of, of the course, many of the students, including myself, were crying because it had been such an intense and emotional uh, journey. But, um, but, it, but it's not just about the period in which we're all together. I think the purpose is not just, um, and I'll end it here, yeah, with me speaking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the purpose isn't just about the, the period in which we are all together. I guess one of the, the kind of the motivations is to be able to use a discussion about feminism to ask many more questions in other aspects of your study and your life. Um, so with that, it's been very, very <laughs> lovely having you with us here. <laughs> Thank you for coming from Suba.